Now, I know what you're thinking. Why is Laron wearing a hoodie indoors? Why doesn't he just stop being a cheapskate and turn on his heat? And my answer to that is, I don't want to, and you can't make me. Readers, I want to introduce a new segment today called Redis Relives. In which case, I let you know more about me, how I grew up, stories of my previous experiences, and some things that influenced me. Which is what today's video is about. The top... The top six things that have influenced me creatively. Now this means film television and books so that's exactly how we're going to do it in that particular order so let's start with films first the scream trilogy directed by wes craven may he rest in peace the scream trilogy was what introduced me to the subgenre of horror called slasher films it also introduced me to the concept of a trilogy as a literary device now i plan on talking a little bit more on that in a video i have planned for nano remo this year but the scream trilogy being at the time one of the most easier ways for me to get into the horror genre because everything scared the fuck out of me. I quickly found it interesting that an individual is capable of producing this type of horror and terror outside of a typical monster or a demon. And because of the Scream trilogy, slashers became my favorite subcategory of the horror genre. Second film, The Lord of the Rings trilogy, because God knows I can't sit through any of those books. There are so many songs, it's ridiculous. Whenever a new Lord of the Rings movie was released, me and my parents would go New Year's Eve to go see them. That means we went to go see The Fellowship of the Ring on New Year's Eve of 2001, Two Towers New Year's Eve of 2002, and Return of the King New Year's Eve 2003. And it was seeing those high budget fantasy films that helped influence me to want to write fantasy of my own. As a matter of fact, I started working on my own high fantasy series, New Year's Day of 2004, the day after watching Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, on New Year's Eve 2003. And I've been working on it ever since. That manuscript has gone through so many revisions. I'm currently working on the latest one now that I hope is the final one, and hopefully I'll eventually publish, either by myself or with the publisher. We'll find out. But yes, as far as the high fantasy setting, exposure to the different races, the different ways of storytelling, it was just a breath of fresh air that I needed as a creator to help me expand my mind outside of what was limited to my surroundings. I would definitely say it's, it's in my list of top five fandoms that I'm a part of. And speaking of another fandom, the third film, I guess series now, because... Star Wars. Because obvious choice is obvious. Now a lot of you readers are going to be very upset at me when I tell you this, but I'm going to tell you this and you have to promise to let me explain, okay? So just sit down, put on your seatbelts, put down your pitchforks. A New Hope was not my first Star Wars film. Are you good? See, readers, back in my back in my childhood household, we had HBO, and a lot of the movies that I liked, my parents didn't necessarily buy me until I sprung interest in them. Specifically, movies that were already released before I was born. That was the case with Ghostbusters, because my first Ghostbusters movie was Ghostbusters 2. I'm sorry! <laughs> Fortunately for me, my first Star Wars movie was still a part of the original trilogy. My first Star Wars movie was Return of the Jedi. Which brings me to my next point. I watched those bitches backwards. <laughs> I saw Return of the Jedi first, then I saw The Empire Strikes Back second, and then I saw A New Hope third. And conveniently enough, I was still able to follow the story and still be just as surprised with the whole I am your father reveal, even when I watched them backwards. Of course, Star Wars opened my eyes to a world of things I couldn't possibly comprehend until I've seen it. 
And I would say it's influential to me because it introduced me to not only a black and white concept, but a gray concept of what good and evil is and what can be accomplished within those brackets, within those tiers. And I've applied it to my writing ever since I started writing science fiction and fantasy of my own. Now on to television. Surprisingly enough, the television list is a very short list. And it's a fairly recent show too. I'm talking about Russell T. Davies' run of Doctor Who. Now Russell T. Davies' run of Doctor Who was influential to me because his way of storytelling taught me how to intertwine small plots into a very big plot that overarcs an entire season or series. This technique is one that I've adapted in my own work and one that I plan on continuing to adapt and grow as I become a better writer. So now we move on to books. Once again, pretty short list. Not as short as my TV show list, but not as long as my movie one either. Because there's only two. There are only two. And both of them would be considered classics in this day and age. I'm not going to say like, Oh, The Hunger Games really inspired me. And I'm not trying to diss anybody who enjoys reading The Hunger Games. They're good books. They're good 27 chapters each books. <laughs> the books that I'm talking about have been taught in schools and I have definitely benefited from as far as learning about symbolism and literary devices and books that I've dissected in order to learn how to incorporate into my own writing. The first one is East of Eden by John Steinbeck. I fucking love that book. It was so deep and everyone in my English class who barely gave a fuck in the first place was pissed off that they had to read this book because it didn't relate to them. And I'm just like, I'm gonna read this. It's gonna take me a slow ass time to read this because I'm a bit of a mediocre reader, but I'm gonna read this. And then I'm going to go to class the next day and then I'm gonna be taught what this use of the color blue was about and that it meant more than just, it was just the fucking color blue. I love that about East of Eden. And I love that about this next book, however, and not to piss off any of my Afrocentric readers out there, I can't stand this author. Whereas her use of literary devices and symbolism is impeccable. The stories are just, why? Like, why are we doing this? And I'm talking about Song of Solomon by Toni Morrison. I feel like the majority of me in this video is just me going, Song of Solomon was like, Song of, S mm. Song of Solomon, Jesus. Song of Solomon had me feeling like Kanye interrupting Taylor Swift all the damn time. Every time something happened to Milkman, every time something happened to his friend, every time something happened to his whack-ass girlfriend, I was just like, hold on, Tony, hold on, Tony. I'm happy for you and I'm going to let you finish. No, I'm not, because I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't. I fucking can't! You have no idea how frustrating that book was to me. And to make matters worse, the English class that I had, we had more than one Toni Morrison book to read. More than one! We had to read this! Sula! Jesus! Jesus! I was only in high school, I didn't deserve this! But no, in all seriousness, Toni Morrison is good at what she does. She's a good writer and she's really good at setting up literary devices and symbolism. And that's one of the things, and along, and along with Steinbeck, that's one of the things that I appreciate. And that's one of the things that I've adapted in my own writing. Steinbeck and Morrison taught me how to be more in depth with my writing. And I'm thankful. So your homework assignment for the day, write in the comments section what influenced you. Let me know, because I'm interested. Because if you suffered like I suffered, I need to know. But this has been Redis 101. Class dismissed.